Hello. Today I have with me Nick Train, manager of a range of well-known and highly popular funds and trusts. Hello, Nick. Lee, hi. Nice to see you. Thanks for having us. Look, Nick, the, the Linsell Train Trust was trading at an 80% premium to net assets before last year's fall. Lots of discussion around that at the time. So it's now sort of closer to even. Um, obviously, that's outside your control. But what were you thinking at 80%? I mean, would you have bought the shares then? Unfair question, but... No, it's not an unfair question. I mean, because we've publicly said that Mike and I would never add to our holdings of the Linsell Train Investment Trust, yeah? That's what we're talking yeah. We do add all the time to our other investment strategies, yes? I mean, I bought more Finsbury for myself this week, okay? But for the Linsell Train Investment Trust, um, we could never condone uh, paying a substantive premium over assets to that trust. And indeed, although, I mean, actually, this is verifiable, we have spent years warning investors in our monthly notes and also in our annual and six monthly reports to shareholders, warning people, please don't <laughs> pay too high a premium to, to, to buy these shares because everybody knows what happens to investment trusts on a premium sooner or later. And that's what happened in 2019. That premium significantly, significantly evaporated. It was going to happen sooner or later with the conversation turns to football. Um, <laughs> so we see it with football managers, there are, are, are highs and lows. Um, there's a status of, um, and you, you are a star fund manager or, or referred to as a star fund manager. Um, does that status put any similar sort of pressure on you either as an individual or, or as a manager of investment portfolios? I promise you my wife does not allow me to regard myself as a star anything. Um, okay. And, you know, I, I, I think investors, the, the healthiest state of mind for an investor is paranoia. Yeah? I always feel paranoid and concerned, uh, whether I'm performing well or whether I'm performing poorly. Uh, so, so star, it's just not in our, my conception of, of, of myself. I think that the real pressure in this industry, and for, if I can put it this way, private or amateur investors as well, the real pressure is to do stuff. You know, you're constantly feeling or try, being persuaded that you should be trading, you should be dealing, you should be responding to all of these myriad pressures or pieces of news or whatever. The really tough thing to do is to work out a way to sit on your hands. You can only sit on your hands if you've got confidence that your underlying strategy is the right one. And I just encourage everybody to get to that state of mind where they believe in what, they've, what they own, the portfolio that they've constructed, and then try and leave as well alone as possible. Don't fund the stockbroking community by trading too much. Okay. Well, look, this has been leading to somewhere. I mean, you own stakes in Manchester United, Juventus and Celtic. Um, do the same drivers responsible for the initial purchases in those clubs still exist? I mean, do you ever worry about that performance on the pitch? I mean, I guess I'm thinking more about Man United at the moment. They won over the weekend. What are you talking about? Well, yeah. Ollie's at the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so you're confident then, clearly confident in the, uh, in the strategy. But does, does that on the pitch performance, I mean, clearly it affects the, um, you, the clubs and, and the finances. But, um, no, listen, listen. Any kind of perspective, any, any kind of time horizon about these sports franchises, we're talking about football clubs, but sports franchises in general, if you look at the valuations that were being put on leading sports franchises, including football clubs, 10 years ago or 20 years ago and compare them today, they are so much more valuable today than ever before. Actually, this is one of the clearest bull markets, if you like, in the world today. The value of sports franchises is going up and up 
And it's easy to understand why when you see the billions of dollars or billions of pounds being pumped into the sports industry by these big media companies. And now by these giant internet companies all looking to muscle in onto televising, televising live sports. The back end of last year, um, a stake was taken in Manchester City not Manchester United, a stake was taken in Manchester City by a US technology firm, Silver Lake Partners it was called, that put a value on Manchester City Football Club of 4.8 billion US dollars. That's the highest value ever ascribed to a football franchise. Uh, and it's just indicative of the escalation in value of these sorts of assets. You know, when I look at the investments that we have in these, uh, these franchises, the three that you've, you've mentioned, I mean, actually, they've been pretty good investments over the period that we've owned them, despite ups and downs of their performance uh, on, on the pitch. Um, and I guess I'd also say, just repeating the three that you mentioned, Manchester United, Celtic and Juve, Juventus, you know, they are pretty high caliber, pretty high caliber sports franchises. I mean, everybody around the world with even a passing interest in the sport is very, very familiar with these. And, you know, we look at them in a way as absolutely unique global, global brands. And global brands, that's what we invest in. Yeah. I guess that one of the reasons for the question was harking back to the so the early part of this century, late 90s, Millwall trading at a penny on the, uh, on the stock exchange. So uh, things have come a long way since then, clearly. Well, you know, Manchester United, when it first listed on the London stock market in 1991, had a market value of £20 million. Only £20 million. Do you know what it's valued at on the New York exchange today? Tell me. £3 billion. So from 20 million quid as a quoted company to three billion dollars, okay, that's taken 30 years. You do the math. Mm. <laughs> that is an incredible uplift in uplift in value, and in our opinion, there's still more to go. Yeah. Well, look, clearly the football clubs aren't keeping you up at night, but um, is is there anything that sort of that does for I guess both the UK and the global funds? I mean, we've got a coronavirus outbreak and all sorts of, sort of, I guess, black swan events. I mean, is, is there anything, I mean, clearly you can't worry about what you don't know is going to happen, but is there anything that, about the industry or about your investments that you, th you lay there and think, well, crumbs, that's, that's a concern, or do you sleep easy? Our whole thing is the attempt to construct portfolios made up of companies that are intrinsically very low risk businesses. That, that's what we're trying to do, to invest in the strongest, most predictable companies, companies that have been successful for decades in the past, in some cases centuries in the past, where we've got some confidence that they will continue to be successful into the, into the future. Do, do you know, that sounds so simple. Um, it is quite a simple idea, but my goodness, if you get it right, if you invest in a business that continues to prosper over the next 10 years, say, you're going to have, you're going to have an investment success. What I will say, though, what I will acknowledge is that there's no question in the 21st century, technology change has accelerated. And we've seen businesses that we've admired for many, many decades stumble and lose their way. Although equally, we've seen companies take advantage of new technologies and create much more value far more quickly than we would ever have dreamt. And that, that makes us, I won't necessarily say lie awake at night, but the first question we ask about any business is, is technology the friend or the enemy of this company? And I still would argue that your answer to that question 
That's probably the most important question to ask about any business you contemplate investing in today. Okay. So there's the argument growth stocks versus value. It's been rumbling on pretty gathered pace over the past 18 months, I guess. Growth has dominated for a, for a decade. Um, how do you see the trend continuing? Is it, is it sort of is, is growth going to dominate value for the foreseeable future, or do you see a, a sort of um, a, a turning point uh, anytime soon? Now, Lee, that's exactly the type of question that I always say I have no idea. I haven't the faintest idea. Yeah. That that involves making predictions about something that's not just it's not just difficult to predict the answer to that question. It's actually impossible. No one knows and no one can know. And therefore, we try and avoid spending too much time angsting about things to which we know there is no correct answer. What I will say to you, and this is not directly answering your question, what I will say to you is that the companies that we are invested in I would say are more optimistic about their growth prospects and completely new avenues for growth than they were five years ago. And I think, you know, when you think objectively, taking a step back, looking at the world as it is today, two massive drivers of growth, let's say digital technology, and also this emerging market story, you know, that's still, they're both still at very, very early, very early stages. Um, you know, when I think about a business, you know, a, a big holding for us, a business as apparently dull as Unilever, say. I mean, we love Unilever. But when you listen to Unilever talking about the opportunities still available to it in emerging markets, Unilever quite credibly will say, we think the next 50 years are going to be better than the last 50 years just because the opportunities are so much greater for their brands. And believe me, the last 50 years for Unilever were pretty good. Um, so I don't know whether growth or value is going to do better. I don't even know whether Unilever is a growth stock or a value stock. It depends which you know, decide yeah. you want to look at it one, one morning over another. But I can assure you, at the corporate coalface, as it were, companies have got lots of ideas about how to grow. Well, you mentioned earlier about technology and sort of trends that you monitor closely. I guess another trend that's really sort of gathering steam is ethical investing. I mean, are you planning to fully integrate ESG into your process at all? Well, I, I'm not quite clear what fully integrate into our process means. Um, but, but what I will say is that, you know, as, as we've already established, what we do is invest in businesses on a much longer time horizon than, than perhaps other professional investors. We've owned companies for 20 years and we're sincerely hoping to own them for another 20 years. What is absolutely self-evident is that no company is going to survive and prosper over the next 20 years unless they pay close attention and respond to their consumers' requests and requirements. Every company has to acknowledge that customers' ethical standards their choices for the way they want to live their lives is changing. And if the companies don't respond to that, then they're going to they're gonna lose out. So um, absolutely, when we meet with businesses, we are strongly encouraging them to respond to societal, political changes and ethical changes. Okay. Nick Train, thank you very much. Thank you.